medicine is not long. It could be 12. You can never let it be done. Mm -hmm. What page is that? Oh, never mind. <laughs> yeah. So that means you have to be grateful for that when come back. Ain't no mama asking, huh? Because it's mm -hmm. a me, huh? Mm -hmm. Oh, I thought it was some chicken strips. You can't warm chicken strips in front of fire. Council members, are y'all ready to start? Madam Clerk, I believe we uh, have accomplished executive session, also have accomplished the 30 minute uh, required uh, recess as well. Yes, I'm gonna do roll call to reestablish the quorum. <clears throat> Thank you. We have Council Member Wynn. Here. Council Member Brissett. Present. Council Member Williams. Present. Council, Council Member Moreno. <clears throat> Present. Council Member Gisson Palmer. Present. Council Member Banks. Present. Council Member Jeruso. Here. We have seven members. We have a quorum. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And for the record, the public comment uh, period has closed uh, and we are back in order. Um, Madam Clerk. Uh, Council Member Gisson Palmer, are you ready to take up your matter? Or shall I go into the consent agenda first? Sure, we can take it up. We're gonna to go to page 30. We have ordinance calendar number 33,151 by Councilmember Gisson Palmer by request. 
an ordinance to amend and reordain section 138-2, 138-38, 138-45, 138-46, 138-47, 138-42 and 138-43 of the Code of the City of New Orleans relative to sanitation roll carts to define and provide specifications and requirements for city roll carts to clarify the times at which roll carts and waste are to be placed on the curb for trash removal in the downtown development district, the French Quarter, French Market Street, between Esplanade Avenue and Dauphine Street and elsewhere in the city and the requirements for bulky waste placement and collection in the downtown development district, the French Quarter, French Street, between Esplanade Avenue and Dauphine Street and elsewhere in the city as otherwise to provide with respect thereto. Great, thank you. Um, I move, do I have a second? Second. Second. All right, thank you, second my, uh, Council President Williams. Council members, as you know, the uh, DDD and the French Quarter have a specific mm -hmm. sanitation schedule and rules to help keep up with the mass of tourists um, that we typically see. Uh, recently, Frenchman has begun to experience similar levels of traffic and the administration deemed it appropriate to expand that same schedule and rules to that area. Director Lear is on the call to discuss the details. Um, Director, are you there? I am here. Thank you. Um, would you like to make a few brief comments about this? Uh, yes. From the standpoint that Frenchman Street, as you mentioned, sees a tremendous amount of foot traffic. Although the Department of Sanitation does clean the section of Frenchman Street between Esplanade Avenue and Dauphine Street and sometimes further every day, there are some changes that would help us keep this section of Frenchman Street cleanly, cleaner. And part of that in the French Quarter is it requires that persons place their solid waste curbside prior to 4 a.m. on the days of collection. But, and certainly we expect that the collection contractors and they will be advised to pick up by 8 a.m. We want all of the residents and small businesses that are serviced by the city to remove their carts from the curb as promptly as possible better than 9 a.m. after the morning collection. Some properties may receive evening collections, but we know that most of those properties are in the morning. But if they do have an evening collection, we ask that that collection occur between 4 p.m. and 6 p.m and that items are put curbside no earlier than 3.30 p.m. That would allow for all the carts to be removed from the curb between the hours of 9 a.m. and 3.30. The other items relate to containment. We really, really want everyone to properly contain their garbage or their recycling. To that end, everything needs to be in black, plastic bags, white trash bags, grocery bags, paper bags, cardboard boxes are not acceptable for a collection of solid waste. And we want all commercial businesses within these designated boundaries to make arrangements with their private collection contractors to increase the frequency of collection during special events if they anticipate significant increases in the volumes of solid waste. So those are the key points. And we just, again, it will allow us as we do our daily cleanup, if the garbage collections have been completed, we don't have collection companies coming at 11 o'clock or 1030 and spilling items on the sidewalk that we've already cleaned. So this will help us. And when we did calls with the businesses along Frenchman Street, there were no objections to these changes. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Director Lear. Um, any other uh, questions or comments from the council members? Well, sure, we're talking trash. <laughs> no comments? Mm -hmm. All right, with that, may we please have a vote? And you need to ask Teresa if we have comments, public comments. Oh, do we have any public comments? I'm so sorry. No okay. council member. Thank you, Teresa. All right, may we please have a vote? Councilmember Wynn? Yay. 
Council Member Brissett. Yay. Council Member Williams. Council Member Moreno. Yay. Council Member Banks. Yay. Council Member Jerusa. Yay. We have six yays, no nays. Ordinance calendar number 33151 has been adopted. Thank you. And I think, Ms. Laura, you did say my name. Yes. Okay. Thank you. We're now going to go to the regular order of the agenda, which will be the consent agenda. I mean, the on page two, I'm sorry. We have the approval of the minutes, October 1st, 2020, October 14th, 2020, special meeting, October 15th, 2020, and October 26th, 2020, special meeting to be approved. I need someone to move and second the approval of the minutes, please. Move. Second. I'm Moreno. Council Member Wynn? Yay. Council Member Brissett? Yay. Council Member Williams? Yay. Council Member Moreno? Yay. Council Member Gisson Palmer? Yay. Council Member Banks? Yay. Council Member Jeruso? Yay. We have seven yays, no nays, and the approval of the minutes. Special orders of business. All special orders are temporarily postponed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Consent agenda. We have a communication from Teresa R. Beecher, Council Research Officer, New Orleans City Council. This should be marked proceed on top of page three. We have a communication from Aaron Spears, Chief of Staff and Council, Council Utilities Regulatory Office. This should be marked proceed. On page four, we have a communication from Amy Scan Scandolito, 4533 Reed Boulevard and 10149 Chef Mature Highway. This should be marked received, suggested hearing date November 19th. We have a communication from Ryan Gregory, authorized agent, Red Mellon, Restoration and Development. Lincoln Grove 1 LLC. This shall be marked received. On top of page five, we have a communication from Ryan Gregory, authorized agent, Red Mellon, Restoration and Development, Lincoln Grove 2 LLC. This should be marked received. We have a communication from John C. Williams, William Architects, 1339 Cluett Street, zoning docket 98. 18, motion M18471. This should be marked received, suggested hearing date is December the 1st. We have communication from David W. Gernhauser, Secretary Board of Liquidation City Debt. This should be marked received. We're on top of page six. We have a communication from Nick and Lizzie Vitter, property owner, 1536 St. Rock Avenue. This should be marked received, suggested hearing date is it's going to be set for today's meeting, November the 5th. We have a communication from Jenna Burke, Director of Land Use, District B, 2018-0290, Canal Street. This should be marked received. Suggested hearing date is November the 19th. On top of page seven, we have the report of the director of the Vukare Commission, 715 Bourbon Street. This should be marked received. We have the report of the executive director of the New Orleans Historic District Landmarks Commission, Central Business District, Historic District Landmarks Commission, 1531 Exposition Boulevard. This should be marked received. We have the report of the executive director of the New Orleans Historic District Landmarks Commission, Central Business District, Historic District Landmarks Commission, 1015 Malpamine Street. This should be Mark received. We're on top of page eight. We have the report of the executive director of the City Planning Commission. This should be Mark received. Suggested hearing date is November 19th. We have ordinance calendar number 33,142 by Council Member Banks, zoning docket 6520. On top of page nine, we have Ordinance calendar number 33,148 
by Council Member Wynn, zoning docket 5520. Those are all the matters on the consent agenda. Move for approval, Madam Clerk. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Council Member Wynn. Um, yay. We have Council comments Member? on the consent agenda. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, the first comment is from Anthony Doby. This question is for Jason Williams. Mr. Williams, since you are still fortunate to be running for DA of New Orleans, I figured you'd like to give us all a glimpse into your legal mind by commenting on a situation. Let's say a normal city employee got drunk and then got into a city vehicle and then got into an accident that nearly killed people. What charges would your office bring against that person for causing an accident while driving drunk in that city vehicle? Would you charge this person with depraved indifference to human life? If you show a depraved indifference towards the life of others, you should be charged with that whether your actions successfully kill someone or not, yes or no. Had Jared Brossett sadly killed the resident he hit, People v. Register would certainly call for a depraved indifference murder charge since that Court of Appeals ruled that intoxication is not a defense or excuse to depraved mind murder. But since Jared's incident luckily didn't result in a murder, just injuries and property damage, you might be of the mind that would want to seek a lesser charge that would better apply. So maybe you could go weak and charge him with wanton endangerment, similarly as to how the officer in the recent Breonna Taylor case was charged. In Taylor's case, the officer fired bullets, putting neighbors in danger. In Jared's case, he put everyone he drunkenly drove past that night in eminent danger. And although there was no gunfire in this case, one could argue that each time Jared Brossett drunkenly pressed the gas pedal, causing the cylinders to fire and the vehicle to gain momentum and speed, he turned the vehicle itself into a virtual live bullet, ready and able to kill anyone in its path. So the wanton endangerment charge could certainly apply here. Or would you completely go weak and seek to give Jared a charge like reckless operation of a motor vehicle, give him his license back, and then send him home and back to work in a second car paid for by the citizens of New Orleans, as if no crime had really been committed. What would DA Jason Williams do? Thank you. The next is Marguerite Pellerin. I request the council uphold the VCC ruling on 715, 719, 717 through 719 Bourbon Street application to deny lowering the building's floor and windows. There is a side alley and back entrance to each building that would permit a handicapped ramp for customers. Granting this application would set in exception. Thank you. Corinne Villavaso. <clears throat> what occurred during Hurricane Zeta supports the claim and position of the community leaders who strongly oppose zoning docket 5520 which will amend the CZO to allow the continued use of non-conforming pole signs in Eastern New Orleans Renaissance Corridor use restriction overlay district. During the hurricane, many of the high pole sign panels were blown out onto the street, causing safety hazards and damage to other people's properties. If the storm was any stronger, the damage would have been worse. This occurrence confirms what we have conveyed to Councilmember Wynn on several occasions. Photos of blown out signs can be found at the link https colon backslash photos dot app dot goo dot gl backslash z o z c y eight x e w a x c h five e x six. Don A Bear. Signage regulations were established for the purpose of safeguarding and protecting the public health, safety, and welfare through appropriate prohibitions, regulations, and controls on the design, location, and maintenance of signs. The purpose of the prohibition of pole signs is public safety. In an effort to promote the safety of persons and properties, pole signs are prohibited, not only in the city of New Orleans, but in cities across America, particularly cities that are prone to high winds and hurricanes. In many cities, not only were new pole signs prohibited, but some cities called for the removal of existing pole signs. The prohibition of pole freestanding signs is a national trend. Just to list a few, following states include cities that have prohibitions on pole freestanding signs. California, Texas, Arizona, Arkansas, Louisiana, Alabama, Florida, and more. References. 
Federal Highway Administration Research Review of Potential Safety Effects of Electronic Billboards on Driver Attention and Distraction, 2001. This is a useful study on this issue. Sign clutter is ugly, costly, and ineffective. All photos were provided by E. McMahon, unless otherwise noted. Represented Jason Hughes. I write in opposition to calendar number 33,148 by council member Wynn. If adopted, this ordinance would allow the continued use of non-conforming pole signs throughout New Orleans East. Many of these pole signs have sat unused since Hurricane Katrina. An overwhelming amount of these poles are corroded and have not been maintained since 2005. I don't see how these pole signs can be safely used and have no evidence and have no evidence that they are safe and stable. During Hurricane Zeta, we saw many pole signs completely blown out. This was one of the reasons the CZO was changed to ban these types of signs. I've heard directly from many residents of New Orleans East who strongly oppose the adoption of this ordinance. I joined them in their opposition. The New Orleans City Planning Commission rightfully voted to deny this request. As a, the former chairman of the New Orleans City Planning Commission and state representative for District 100, I respectfully oppose calendar number 33,148 and respectfully ask that you vote no. Jason Hughes, State Representative, District 100. This one is submitted by Sylvia Richard, President of the ENONAC. Mm -hmm. ENONAC has participated in three Zoom community meetings and an ENO, ENONAC meeting with Councilmember Wynn and her staff regarding her motion number M2262, overturning CPC's recommendation of denial on zoning docket 5520. During these several presumed recorded meetings, the opposition to motion number 2262 was strongly expressed verbally. Our PowerPoint presentation that outlines our position was emailed to all city council members on Monday, August 31st, 2020. Moreover, public comments that opposed were submitted during the September 3rd regular city council meeting, and we later found out that the matter was deferred. It was to our surprise that with the expressed overwhelming opposition from the community, that the motion was still adopted without any regard to the community's concerns. Those are all of the comments on the consent agenda. Okay, we'll call for the vote now. Council Member Wynn? Yay. Council Member Brissett? Yay. Council Member Williams? Yay. Council Member Moreno? Yay. Council Member Gisson Palmer. Yay. Council Member Banks. Yay. Council Member Jerusalem. Yay. Seven yeas, no nays. The consent agenda is now being adopted. We're now going to go to page 10. We have regular agenda, land use matters. All land use are scheduled to commence at 11 a.m. or thereafter. All public comments on land use items are subject to City Council Rule 10.1b, whereby each land use matter is limited to a maximum public comment period of 20 minutes, with speakers being limited to two minutes per item. No seating of public speaking time is permitted. Legislative grouping, demolition requests of Gloria Homes requesting demolition of property located at 3118 Second Street. We have motion M2377 by Council Member Banks, a motion denying the demolition permit for property located at 3118 Second Street. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I'll make uh, a move that we um, approve the motion denying the demolition. Can I get a second? A second. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, this is for a church in the Central City Hoffman Triangle area. They bought the shotgun house next door. Um, the thoughts were, the initial thoughts were to demolish the house and uh, use it for parking. Uh, they're no longer going to do that. So um, I will ask your support on this. So with that, can I get a vote, Madam Clerk? Council Member Wynn? Yay. Council Member Banks? I mean, Brissett? Aye. Uh, Council Member Williams? Aye. Council Member Moreno. Aye. Council Member Gisson Palmer. Aye. Council Member Banks. Aye. Council Member Jeruso. Yay. Seven yeas, no nays. Motion M2377 has been adopted. We're now on top of page 11. 
we have a legislative group in demolition request of Kyle Gilmore requesting demolition of the property located at 1323 South Rampart Street. We have motion M20371 by council member Banks, a motion approving the demolition for 1323 South Rampart Street, subject to compliance with terms and plans contained within the memorandum of agreement by and among the New Orleans Redevelopment Authority, the Louisiana State Historic Preservation Officer and the City of New Orleans executed and approved by Mayor Latoya Cantrell on May 18, 2020, Exhibit A. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, I move to approve the demolition. Can I get a second, please? Second. Thank you, Councilman Jeruso. Uh, this is a NORA-owned property, and typically I don't uh, support demolitions of housing stock, but this one was a special circumstance, and all of the materials that are going to come from this uh, structure are going to be deconstructed and used in other facilities. Um, this, uh, again, this is one that, that I typically do not ask for, but I think that this is a good one to do. So with that, can we get a vote, Madam Clerk? Do we have any comments, Teresa? Oh, I'm sorry. No, we don't have anything till item five. Okay. Council Member Wynn? Um, Council Member Banks, Yay. I have a question. Yes. I'm sorry. Um, how long has Laura owned this property and were they the ones that allow it to get into disrepair? That I do not know. If you give me a minute, I will try to find that out. I do not know. I just think it's something that we need to ask. And since it was a basically a quasi city state owned property. Um, so would you like me to stand down on this temporarily or you no, want me to move forward and just give you information? Yeah, I would just like to know. And my understanding is, is, is Felicity redevelopment assisting with the deconstruction of the materials? There were preservation entities that are helping. I'm not sure if it's Felicity Redevelopment or not, but there are um, preservation entities that are helping us with the deconstruction. I'm not sure which of them it is. Okay. But again, I can find it out for you. That's fine. Thank you. Okay. Council Member Wynn? Yay. Council Member Brissett? Yay. Council Member Williams? Aye. Council Member Moreno? Aye. Council Member Gisselson Palmer? Aye. Council Member Banks? Aye. Council Member Jeruso? Yay. Seven yeas, no nays. Motion M2371 has been adopted. We're now going to go to page 12. We have a legislative grouping. HDLC appeal of Alyssa Warnett, Director of Operations, the Demo Diva LLC, requesting to appeal the Historic District Landmarks Commission's decision of denial for demolition for property located at 2326 Robert Street. Motion M2378 by Council Member Banks. A motion upholding HDLC's denial of the demolition appeal for property located at 2326 Robert Street. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, I move that uh, we approve the motion upholding the denial of the demolition. Can I get a second? Second. Thank you. I, I heard several, so I'm not sure which one, but thank you all. Uh, Councilmember Brissett. This is, uh, thank you, Councilmember Brissett. This is a, uh, a, a a residential home uh, built in the 20s. While it definitely does need work, it doesn't rise to the level that we think uh, it should be demolished. Now we're working with the family, uh, trying to get it so that they can move their mama back here. She is currently living in Metro and wants to move back here. So um, we've talked to several of the entities trying to help them with getting uh, direction on what they need to do to get it back so that uh, it can be inhabited mm -hmm. and uh, we don't have to tear it down. Uh, so with that, I don't know if we have comments. No, not uh, on this one. Nothing on no, this no. one? No. Okay, um, so with that folks, I would ask uh, for the vote. Council Member Wynn? Yay. Council Member Brissett? Aye. Council Member Williams? Aye. Council Member Moreno? Yay. Council Member Gisselson Palmer? Yay. Councilmember Banks. Yay. Councilmember Jeruso. Yay. 
Seven yeas, no nays. Motion M2378 has been adopted. Number two. The HDL COP of Sharon Bourne has been deferred to November the 19th. On top of page 13, legislative grouping, HDL COP of Rebecca yeah. Hurst, Sherman Strategies, and Tyler Thompson. Requesting to appeal the Historic District Landmarks Commission's HDLC decision of denial of the partial demolition to allow for a renovation for property located at 1531 Exposition Boulevard. We have motion M20378, 375, I'm sorry, by Council Member Jeruso. A motion overruling the HDLC's denial and granting the applicant's appeal. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, Brian, are you presenting or is it Eleanor? Um, Eleanor is going to be presenting. Thank you. Do you want me to go ahead? Yes, please. Good to see you, Eleanor. Nice to see you. Okay, 1531 Exposition Boulevard is a contributing rated structure located in the Uptown Partial Control Demolition Only Historic District. Benborn map research indicates the building was constructed sometime between 1896 and 1909. It first appears on the 1909 Sanborn map as a one and a half story raised basement residence with a full width front porch facing Audubon Park. It appears that the building has retained its original style, scale, massing, footprint, and roof form to this day, with the exception of a one story garage structure at the rear and two attic level sleeping porches on the left and right elevations completed later at an unknown date. The Colonial Revival style center hall bungalow appears to have had its original windows replaced, but retains all of its other original character defining architectural elements, such as a symmetrical facade, wood weatherboards, and building trim, paired box columns on the front porch, paired pane over panel wood entry doors with side lights and transom, Masonry chimneys, front and rear parapets, wood pilasters on the rear of the building, and terracotta tile roofing. Robert Cangelosi, preservation architect, architectural historian who performed the survey work for the Uptown National Register Historic District and author of several volumes of the New Orleans Architecture Series recently wrote, 1531 Exposition Boulevard is typical of its period, blending architectural styles of the early 20th century in an eclectic manner. The most prominent style is colonial revival style. However, it also has some successionist influences evident in the side porch configuration, the hall mantle and the red tile roof. The successionist style was used in New Orleans most prominently by architect H. Jordan McKenzie, who was influenced by the works of Austrian architect Joseph Olbrich. While there have been some more recent alterations, this house retains its defining elements. The, the, concur, the current proposed alterations do not respect the historic fabric of the house and do not follow current preservation philosophies required by the National Park Service and preservation commissions across the country. If the applicant were applying for historic tax credits, this application would be denied. The proposed approach follows the outdated French architect Voyer Ledoux approach to preservation, restore a property to the way it should have been built Imagine if that philosophy were taken to the St. Louis Cathedral, which is very atypical for the 1850s. If the proposed alterations were executed to the property, would change from a contributing element of the Uptown National Register District to a non-contributing element based on National Park Service guidelines. The proposed alterations do not respect this historic architectural integrity of this early 20th century cottage. The applicant is requesting to structurally remove approximately 65% of the roof, approximately 33% of the primary facade, and to alter the size and location of every original window opening in order to increase the square footage of the second floor and to the open facade for the increased visibility to the park. The proposed roof modifications would entail removing all of the existing historic roof structure visible from the street, the front and rear parapets, as well as the terracotta tile roofing and would impose a new form that is consistent with the inconsistent with the type scale style of the original building. The proposed fenestration size and patterning modifications proposed are likewise inappropriate to the building style and will negatively impact the architectural significance of the residence. 
Based on this and the total amount of roof and facade demolition requested, and because the proposed full floor addition is inconsistent with the HDLC guidelines for additions, the HDLC staff recommended denial of the application. At their meeting of September 30th, the commissioners reviewed the testimony of the architect, the owner's representative, Mr. Michael Sherman, photos of the structure, and both public support and opposition to the project. The commission requested that the owners consider pairing with a local architect to, to propose a renovation better suited to the existing historic structure and character of Exposition Boulevard. The commissioners then voted unanimously to deny the application. The Uptown Local Historic District was established in 2018 to protect the historic structures of the Uptown National Register Historic District from demolition. In addition to full demolition, the demolition definition adopted in 2018 recognizes that a historic structure's architectural significance and character can also be severely compromised by substantial alterations. As a result, if a plan proposes to remove more than 25% of the facade, 50% of the roof, or 50% of the exterior walls, this proposal triggers HDLC demolition review. In this case, the changes proposed to the facade and the roof line are drastic enough that the end product would bear little relationship to the style and character of the historic, of the existing historic structure. It is for this reason that the HCLC recommends denial of the application. The advocate for these, this property will tell you that what is being proposed is a fabulous intervention that will enhance what is currently a stylistically drab and confused structure. However, that remains, the fact remains that the architectural historians of the National Park Service rated the building as contributing to the Uptown National Register Historic District. And as such, it should be preserved and maintained. The commission agrees that the historic structures in its districts need to change and expand to accommodate the desires of owners and the demands of modern living. The HDLC design guidelines encourage alterations and additions that are sympathetic to the architectural style and type of the historic structure. This proposed demolition as currently designed undermines the handsome and elegant simplicity of this historic structure. The commission believes that the property owner can achieve the increase in square footage and modern amenities they desire while working within the style and character of the building rather than against it. The staff of the HDLC would be more than happy to assist with this process. We encourage the City Council to deny this appeal and encourage the owner to reconsider a design that does not destroy the architectural style and significance of the structure. That's it. Thank you, Eleanor. I appreciate it. Um, colleagues, this is not a full demolition. This home, like other uptown house, has a mishmash of styles. The raised basement will be used as living space and the expanded windows create a more cohesive style to make it uh, a single colonial style rather than um, this, this um, different types of forms that are part of the house. Moreover, the applicant's request to change the roof pitch will allow more living space and, and less square footage. So with that, I move to overrule the HDLC's denial and grant the application. May I have a second? Second. Thank you. Um, I know there's some public comments. Any comments from my colleagues? Ms. Beecher? First comment is from Valerie Vives. It is important to the fabric of our city to maintain the history of our buildings that make up our city. The HDLC exists to protect this cultural aspect of the city. They should be trusted and the city council should defer to them and not become a loophole because you have money and want to change the fabric of the city. The owners had an option to buy a different home in a different area and now do not want to follow the rules or preserve the city. I hope you stand in support with the HDLC and reject the request. David Clay, please deny this appeal and affirm the HDLC's correct decision do not allow the historic fabric of New Orleans to be further destroyed. This beautiful historic residence sits in a prominent position fronting Audubon Park. Allowing its current owners to ruin its existing facade would be both dangerous, um, excuse me, be both damaging and senseless. Tyler Thompson. 
my wife and I acquired this wonderful structure in need of a total renovation to be our family home. We spent months planning a truly historic restoration. Our goal is not just to preserve the historic architecture, but to enhance it by removing non-historic additions, taking out mismatched elements and providing a unified architectural style, which is appropriate for this district. We went door to door in our neighborhood and all of our neighbors are in support of our project. We respectfully ask for your support so that we may proceed with this renovation and restoration. Ella Camberbeck, please do not allow the landmark that is at 1531 Exposition to be altered beyond recognition. If the owners want a new mega mansion, they need to build elsewhere. Nathan Lott. First, I want to thank Councilmember Geruso and the District A staff for their consistent responsiveness and professionalism. Rarely do we weigh in on partial demolition permits, partly because most are routine camelback additions, but also because it's a good thing when people invest in historic buildings and neighborhoods. In this instance, however, I am compelled to say that in the view of Preservation Resource Center, the commission acted correctly in denying the applicant's request. In partial control districts, the job of the HDLC is to preserve historic material and designs, not review the merits of new buildings or additions. The commission unanimously denied the permit on the grounds that the proposed alterations require the removal of too much historic fabric and obscure the building's original design. Should the council opt to overturn the commission, I would ask that at the very least, the applicant is requested to maximize the amount of historic building materials that are reused on site or salvaged for use elsewhere. The last comment is from J. Allen Harris II. I am the architect for this project. I'd like to share with the city council the intent of the proposed renovations. The renovations concentrate on celebrating those original historic elements which are successful while diminishing those mostly later modern features which are less successful and which considerably detract from its historical significance and contribution to New Orleans. The principal reason we are before the council appears to relate to the roof and the windows. Through the renovation, the more prevalent colonial revival style is showcased with a simple change in the roof framing to express a series of three gables on the side elevation, rather than the current long and low pitched roof of squatty and obtuse proportions. The ill matched and poorly arranged windows and doors are replaced throughout with those of proper consistent proportion and historical detail, and with stronger symmetry in order to give the home a cohesive Fenestration language. We ask for your support because this renovation will enhance the historic district. Those are all the comments. Thank you very much, Teresa. Madam Clerk. Councilmember Wynn. Yay. Councilmember Brissett. Yay. Councilmember Williams. Aye. Councilmember Moreno. Yay. Councilmember Gissels and Palmer. Yay. Councilmember Banks. Yay. Councilmember Jeruso. Yay. We have seven yeas, no nays. Motion M2375. Madam Clark. Yes. Madam Clark, it was 6 1. Councilmember Palmer voted no. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, everybody. At the bottom of the page, HDLC appeal of Eric Iglesias is deferred to November 19th. We're on top of page 14, the VCC appeal of Arl R. Silverstein has been deferred to November the 19th. A legislative grouping extension requests of Jason A. Riggs, managing member, historic Pro Nola LLC requesting a one-year extension to ordinance number 27,869 MCS, granting a conditional use to permit an established multifamily dwelling for the property located at 3417 through 3423 and 3417A through 3423A South Liberty Street, zoning docket 7518. We have motion M2379, by council member Banks, a motion approving the one year extension for the conditional use granted in ordinance number 20, 
27,869, zoning docket 7518. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, I'm gonna move for approval. Can I get a second? Second. Thank you, Joe. Um, do we have any comments, Madam Clerk? Yes, we have one public comment on this. If we could, please, Teresa. The comment is from Jason Riggs. Construction on these properties has been delayed by financing issues and then COVID-19. Construction has commenced though. Please extend my conditional use approval for another 12 to 18 months so I have time to complete the project. There has been no opposition to this historic redevelopment of these blighted properties. That's the only comment. Thank you. Colleagues, I ask you for your support on this. Uh, this is my typical weekly uh, song about affordable housing. This will put eight affordable units back in the commerce. Uh, the developer does need time. I mean, he, like everybody else, has been affected by, by COVID and uh, giving him more time, um, I think is a good thing. And at the end, this will result in eight more housing units where they're desperately needed for our folks to be able to live in this city. So with that, Madam Clerk, would you call the roll? Council Member Wynn? Yay. Council Member Brissett? Aye. Council Member Williams? Aye. Council Member Moreno? Yay. Council Member Gisselson Palmer? Yay. Council Member Banks? Yay. Council Member Jeruso? Yay. We have seven yays, no nays. Motion M20379 has been adopted. We're now on top of page 15, a legislative grouping. We have post demolition fee waiver request of Nick and Lizzie Vitter, property owner, requested to appeal the assessed post demolition fee of $12,915, originally incorrectly calculated as $13,050 for property located at 1536 St. Rock Street, Avenue, St. Rock Avenue. Motion M20376 by Council Member Gisselson Palmer, a motion granting the appeal and reducing the permit fee to $5,000. So moved, do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Council Member Set. Um, Council Members, at our last meeting, we considered a demolition application for 1536 St. Rock, which was complicated by the fact the owner had already illegally demolished parts of the home and added a camelback and a new facade. The council passed a motion partially denying the demolition request, requiring that parts of the, of the facade be restored back to the original condition. The code requires that the former NCDAC applicants who proceeded with illegal denial before getting permit approval are subject to a post demolition permit fee assessed at 15% of the value of the building. That fee, in the amount of $12,915 is what the owners are appealing today. I'll also note that applicants in this situation are subject to an additional fee at 100% of the building permit cost, which for these owners equals to about $2,000. That fee can't be appealed to the council. So just so you know, that would be 2,000 on top of the 12,915. So basically now that 2000 will be on top of the 5000 that we're that we're proposing to um, to be reduced to. So after working with the applicants and safety and permits, I've put forth the motion today to reduce the post demolition fee from almost 13000 to $5000. It's clear that I'm deeply concerned about illegal demolitions not only from a historic preservation perspective but also because the lack of life safety oversight they present. I also understand firsthand the complexities our administrative systems entail and the delays they may cause, especially for demolition applicants who were impacted by the recent legal changes to our NCDAC review system. Part of the compromise folks is also because this, um, how we have made changes to the NCDAC review system, Councilmember Banks and I did this, it did add um, a ridiculous amount of time to a lot of projects that were currently in the queue. This compromise. Two considerations that will allow the applicants to resume construction without any further delay. So with that, um, do we have any public comments? Great. We do not, Council Member. Okay, thank you. 
Ms. Johnson, um, would you please take roll? Council Member Wynn? Yay. Council Member Brissett? Aye. Council Member Williams? Aye. Council Member Moreno? Yay. Council Member Gisson Palmer? Yay. Council Member Banks? Yay. Council Member Jeruso? Yay. We have seven yeas, no nays. Motion M2376 has been adopted. Thank you. On top of page 16, all matters, zoning docket 6420 has been deferred to 1119. Zoning docket 7120 has been deferred to 1119. On top of page 17, all matters, zone ordinance calendar number 32,930 has been deferred to 1119. Ordinance calendar number 32,932 has been deferred to 1119. On page 18, all matters. Ordinance calendar number 32,982 has been deferred to 1119. Ordinance calendar number 33,008 has been deferred to 1119. On page 19, ordinance calendar number 33,009 has been deferred to 1119. On page 20, all matters. Ordinance calendar number 33,018 has been deferred to 1119, as well as the amendment has been deferred to 1119. On page 21, all matters. Ordinance calendar number 33,020 has been deferred to 1119, as well as the substitute amendment been deferred to 1119. On page 22, all matters. Ordinance calendar number 33,021 has been deferred to 1119. Ordinance calendar number 33,081 has been deferred to 1119. On top of page 23, ordinance calendar number 33,088 by Council Member Williams by request an ordinance to grant a non-exclusive wireless franchise to Turo Blanco LLC to construct maintain, operate, and authorize new wireless facilities on and under public rights of way within the corporate limits of the city of New Orleans with locations subject to the approval of the grantor to provide for annual payments and the furnishing of a surety bond and otherwise to provide with respect thereto. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Any questions uh, from colleagues or statements? You're on mute. I'm sorry. I do. Um, and they're not written down. So maybe you can just kind of walk me through what we're doing here. I'm looking at this through the perspective of the French Quarter and um, the designs. So I went out to the site to review. Um, they, they, they brought out a, um, a poll that was going to look more in line with the other polls within the French Quarter. While I was out there, there were a couple of these uh, other companies. I think Verizon was there and another one. And then they were talking about how it, it'll only work for single service and not to co-locate um, multiple services within one post, right? And I thought the goal of this was to design something that could have multiple users so that we would not have a huge number of these new polls that don't really match all throughout the French Quarter. I completely agree with all that. This is not uh, addressed the polls today, only the franchise of the quarter, but we have Director of Curo, uh, Ms. Spears on the line, and I believe Jonathan Rhodes from the administration as well to answer your questions specifically. Uh, Ms. Right, so, so I appreciate that and I'm glad that they're online because I just don't want to, so those are my concerns, right? And I just wanna make sure we're not doing something that could then limit our ability to tell them what we want in our neighborhoods. Does that make sense, council member? And I know this has gone through your committees and, and I'm sorry for this, but I don't sit on the smart cities um, uh, committee. I sit on the somewhat smart city committee. So um, what, what do we do to make sure that we have negotiating power, if that makes sense, so that we can protect not just the French Quarter, but I really believe that whatever is decided in the French Quarter can have ramifications through our historic neighborhoods across the city. No, absolutely right. Um, and you know, we've seen uh, things like this happen before. I think the last 
iteration uh, a few decades ago would be telephone booths um, that are still that we're still stuck with because mechanisms were not put in place. Uh, but Aaron Spears has been focused on this, and actually, um, I know there's been a quite a bit of work with the community uh, in the French Quarter to make sure that what does come is in line aesthetically uh, with the French Quarter. I think it'll be helpful in other parts of the city as well. Uh, Mrs. Spears, you're still on mute, though. Okay. Oh, yeah, I, I meant to be. <laughs> All right, smart. Um, but I, yeah, council members, I think you, un you understand the problems that we're dealing with. The code amendments that you guys approved last year have done the council's best effort to ensure that new structures in the public right of way are aesthetically in line with existing infrastructure. I... I believe, particularly in the French Quarter, that Brian Block has been involved in the review process to make sure that new polls, as they are being considered, we do have, council member, as you put it, the negotiating power to ensure that the polls match and are in line with what is expected in the VCC. Right, but the polls that Toro Blanco just brought out to show the community, they're not in favor of them. Right, so this agreement does not approve those designs. This agreement does not approve any specific design. That approval process happens through safety and permits, DPW and VCC, so on the administrative side. This is just the very, very first step to begin that process. Okay, I, I, I appreciate that. I just want to make like these concerns very clear and I wanna make sure that we're not hurting our ability to determine um, how we want not only the polls to look, but also the number of polls, right? Because I think the number of polls can also negatively influence um, the, the community. And my other concern is, is section 106 review, is that enough to protect us? So in addition to the section 106 review, the code that you guys approved last year also has minimum space requirements. And I think it's something like you can't have more than a pole within 90 feet of existing structures. So that gets to your point about encouraging co-location on one pole as opposed to putting up multiple poles and, and cluttering the right of way. Okay. And I would just say, Councilman Palmer, your fears are shared, um, which is why uh, we, we, we got re-engaged uh, with that whole rewrite um, you know, over a year ago, knowing um, that there would be a desire to put new equipment and infrastructure up and it'd be necessary to make sure that um, uh, we, we, we are able to uh, embrace uh, growing technologies. And, uh, and I believe that there are systems in place and people in place, thank you, Mr. Spears, um, uh, to protect the aesthetic nature of not just the French Quarter, but specifically the French Quarter and all of our historic neighborhoods. Nobody wants to look at something ugly uh, just because it is going to help them. All right, thank you. Uh, Council Member, uh, Council Vice President Moreno. Thanks, Council President. So um, just to, to clarify from, from what I understand, um, based on federal regulations, and, and Aaron helped me out here, we can't prohibit um, these going up on the poles. We can only um, take a look at like the design of, of these, of what, the, what they'll look like, but we can't stop them from going on the poles. Is that correct? Right, council member, the latest FCC order, in fact, expressly states that local municipalities cannot prohibit this technology from being deployed. So the code rewrite that we did, it exercises to the greatest extent that we can under the law our rights to limit what goes in the right of way by putting in place design requirements and encouraging co-location and, and putting in minimum spacing and height requirements and things like that, camouflaging. Right, right. So, so this next question, if, if Jonathan, are you on the are you on the Zoom with us, Jonathan Rhodes? He's supposed to be. Well, because because here's here's where I'm I'm going with this. I know that the emails I received, and I'm sure Council Member Palmer received the same. Maybe you did too, uh, Mr. President. Is from neighbors saying that they that 
they want to be part of this process and, and possibly even be part of a specific task force so that they can really be engaged in the design piece. And so I just want to see if, if, you know, if Jonathan's on, if he would be willing to put some type of group together like that, a, a type of task force to kind of be involved in the design piece. But if, if I don't know if he's on, so. I'm trying to figure out what happened to him. He's supposed sure. to be on this call for a uh, question. Give us one second to get him here. Uh, Council Vice President, did you conclude while we're waiting for him? I yeah, that's fine, that's fine. I can try texting him too, but I just wanna make sure that there is some type of assurance that, that as we move forward with this, that there will be you know, the, this engagement of the, the, the residents of the French Quarter, um, businesses in the French Quarter, when we talk about what these are gonna look like there and really throughout the city. I know. I think I think your point is, is is super worthwhile. We are two different branches of government, um, and, and and coming up with uh, the legislation to do something is one thing, but the execution is also important. So let's see if we can get that representative from the executive branch on who's supposed to be on about that. I think it's worth waiting. Councilman Palmer. Yes, uh, my understanding is that they have been engaged, uh, Council Vice President, and they and and so my comments are coming after that engagement process where they're still not satisfied in terms of what the new design rollout was. So I think your points are, are spot on. I hope that they can continue to be at the table, but right now there seems to be a confusion about the co-location piece because the, the Toro Blanco was saying they would co-locate and all of the suppliers are saying, no, that will not work for them. And my concern is that's going to lead to about you know twice as many polls that that are necessary because of this and you're right councilman moreno my, my the you know that the ftc rules are, are much are much more stringent and allowable than what we can do and um and my fear is that they could potentially trump what the locals want <laughs> more ways than one i guess but um yeah Just giving him a couple more minutes to get on. He knew there was going to be some questions. So let's just see. It appears it was uh, technological difficulties, uh, uh, not due to any um, any poll issues, um, but. Uh, he should be calling in in about 30 seconds. Hey, Jonathan, did you log in? Mr. President, I don't wanna be the one that delays all of this. I mean, maybe uh, Aaron can help me here. I mean, I just want some type no, of- no, don't, 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 don't it, this is not you delaying it. Uh, uh, we spoke to the admin uh, before today. Uh, this is a people's work. 
Uh, he's involved in the people's work. Uh, you know, this is not, this is their delay. I mean, that, that is a legitimate question and, uh, and we need to have that on the record. I'm not sure why he wasn't on before. Are you on Jonathan? What I was going to say, Mr. President, is I'm happy to, to move on to other items, if you don't mind just temporarily deferring this so we can continue to move on with our meeting. Absolutely. And then Let's we can that. come back to this. When he okay. That, okay, that sounds good. I just want to make sure that we were not uh, ignoring the questions that were on the table. Uh, Madam Clerk, let's move on. We'll come back to this when the minister, when uh, Jonathan Rhodes has joined the call. Thank you, Ms. Spears. Can you hold on to for us? I'll be here. Thank you. We're now on page 24, the legislative grouping, ordinance calendar number 33,089 by council member Williams by request an ordinance granting a non-exclusive franchise to Toro Blanco LLC to construct, maintain, and operate an above ground and or underground fiber optic based communication system to provide for the furnishing of a surety bond, annual payments, and otherwise to provide with respect thereto. And there is an amendment to ordinance 33,089 by council member Williams. An amendment clarifying that the adjustment to the franchise fee provided for in section 4A2 shall be based on the actual increase in the consumer price index and not the average increase in the consumer price index. That's the amendment. Council members, just to be clear, this is the wire line agreement. So this infrastructure would be primarily in the ground not the above ground facilities that we were discussing on the previous ordinance. Council member Williams, I just read the amendment to ordinance calendar 33,089 into the record. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I was just trying to uh, lock down whether or not we have. To... I'd move adoption on this. I don't know that we have public comment, although I still want to defer uh, the previous matter. Is there a second? I think we have an amendment we need to take up on this one, Jason. I read the amendment, so you will be voted on the amendment right now. I move adoption on the amendment. I'll second. Second by Council Vice President. Any public comment or questions for the days? Madam Clerk. Council Member Wynn. Yay. Council Member Brissett. Yay. Council Member Williams. Aye. Council Member Moreno. Yay. Council Member Gisses and Palmer. Yay. Council Member Banks. Council Member Jeruso. Yeah. We have six yeas, no nays, and the amendment is adopt adopted. Now we need to adopt the ordinance as amended. I would move on the ordinance as amended. Is there a second? Second. Uh, it's been seconded by, who's that? Council Member Jeruso. Council Member Jeruso, thank you, Joseph. My voice sounds very much like Jay's, just in case you got confused. <laughs> The volume does not, though. <laughs> Council Member Wynn? Yay. Council Member Brissett? Yay. Council Member Williams? Aye. Council Member Moreno? Yay. Council Member Gisson Palmer? Yay. Council Member Banks? Council Member Jeruso? Yay. We have six yays, no nays, and the ordinance. 33,089 has been adopted as amended. We're now going to go to page 25, legislative grouping, ordinance calendar number 33,113 by council members Banks and Williams, 
an ordinance to grant a request for a map amendment to apply the mandatory inclusionary zoning regulations established by ordinance number 28,036 by MCS by designating certain inclusionary zoning districts on the official zoning map as recommended in 2019 New Orleans inclusionary zoning study from HR and A Advisors Inc. The proposed map amendment would impact properties within the core and strong market areas as shown on the map within the City Planning Commission report dated April 24, 2020, and otherwise to provide with respect there to zoning docket 3120. And there is an amendment to ordinance 33,113 by council members Banks and Williams. An amendment to establish an effective date contingent upon the effective date of calendar number 33,318. Require within two years of passage and every two years thereafter, a public hearing by the City Planning Commission, CPC, to consider whether a market feasibility analysis is needed to inform changes to map amendments with the CPC ultimately recommended if a study should be conducted. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I move adoption. Second. Do we have any comments, Teresa? Yes, ma'am, we do. First comment is from Mary Phillips. Last year, over half of all renters in the city of New Orleans were cost burdened. With the impact of COVID-19, I believe that more needs to be done to ensure the safety and housing of New Orleans residents. We can address affordable housing with density through more units. The updated maps will do just that by providing affordable housing in more areas of the city. I urge you council members, please put housing first by passing this ordinance. Hashtag fix the mix. And that same comment was also submitted by Tyra Gross and Guinevere Wilson. And this one's slightly different. Lou White, with the impact of COVID-19, I believe that more needs to be done to ensure the safety of housing in New Orleans residents, especially for those who are more vulnerable because they are experiencing homelessness. We can address affordable housing with density through more units. The updated maps will do just that by providing affordable housing in more areas of the city. Lewis Adams, please give consideration to for the smart housing mix, giving affordable and safe housing to our most vulnerable citizens and current residents, especially in the COVID pandemic. Thank you. John Sullivan, noting that he is a paid representative of enterprise community. We ask that you approve this map amendment for inclusionary zoning. Isabel Fague. Since the launch of the Housing NOLA plan in 2015, the developer members of the Greater New Orleans Alliance, GNOHA, have remained firmly committed to bringing mandatory inclusionary zoning to the city of New Orleans. GNOHA was founded in 2007 with the goal of rebuilding New Orleans in an ethical manner, and we were proud to incubate and launch Housing NOLA in order to ensure that need and will of this community would be front and center. With the Housing NOLA plan, we have equitable and executable strategies that is grounded by data. We are proud to support this effort and urge the council and the administration to move quickly to implement the smart housing mix. It must be noted that the continued delay in implementation of this and other policies is the reason that the 2020 Housing NOLA report card issued its first F for our collective efforts around combating this crisis. Before COVID-19, more than half of all renters were spending more than 30% of their income on housing costs. But with COVID-19's impact on employment and industry in our city, we are certain those numbers have increased. We have not been keeping pace with the production needs for affordable housing while rents and market rate buildings continue to increase. But creating potential for residents to move into high opportunity neighborhoods, the smart housing mix addresses economic segregation and guarantees that affordable housing is being built near fresh food, public transit and jobs, improving the quality of life for many residents. Maxwell Sidurlo. The Fair Housing Action Center strongly supports, oh, he is noting yes, that he is a paid representative of the Louisiana Fair Housing Action Center. 
The Louisiana Fair Housing Action Center strongly supports this ordinance and we thank the council for all the work you've done on the smart housing mix in the past four years. Throughout this process, we've heard doomsday scenarios from the corporate landlord lobby who tried twice to strip our ability to make this decision locally. The maps before you today and the amendment that builds in the ability to adjust them every two years are the result of careful study of our housing market by outside experts. Sadly, COVID-19 has only exacerbated the incredible inequity in our residents' access to housing. The wealthy are making huge profits and luxury home prices continue to rise. Meanwhile, renters and small landlords are staring down the cliff of tens of thousands could lose their homes this January when the CDC eviction moratorium ends. The smart housing mix was designed to address exactly this kind of stark inequality. Let's continue to follow the data and move forward with implementation without delay. Thank you. Those are all the comments for item 23. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, I don't know if you wanted to uh, make any comments on this, uh, Councilman Banks, but I was- Yes, sir, I do, please. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Council President. Uh, this is just a part of the package to be able to get us to have this mandatory inclusionary zoning implemented. This is being put forward today because it's on deadline. It's a zoning issue that we've got a time constraint that we've got to adhere to. But I want to be clear with everybody listening. We are intentional on trying to get a mechanism in place to actually do something. Getting a paper victory, just saying that we have adopted a mandatory inclusionary zoning ordinance and then having no affordable housing built doesn't do anything. We're not doing this just to be able to beat our chest and say, oh yeah, we got a legislation passed and then have no impact. The actual win in this is not having an ordinance adopted. The actual win is having a mechanism in place that is going to encourage the development of affordable housing. We are currently working to make sure that all of the facets of this thing to do just that. Now, there are developers involved, there are housing advocates involved, we're involved, and a bunch of players are sitting at the table trying to work this out. I fully understand that this is not going fast enough. It's not going fast enough for me. But the fact is, is that in order to get it right, we've got to be intentional and we've got to check all of the boxes. All of the I's have to be dotted and the T's have to be crossed to make sure we've got something that doesn't just say we've got it, but that is actually going to result in affordable housing being developed. So with that, Thank you, Council President. Uh, I would, I'm glad to second this and we call the vote on this one and we will continue to work on the other aspects of it so that we can get something that will be more than just an emotional victory that will have a practical implementation and we can actually touch affordable housing issues. Thank you, Council Member Baines for those words and your commitment to this. Uh, we already had huge housing and security issues uh, in this city. Uh, long before we knew what COVID-19 was, I think it is, is painfully obvious uh, that that uh, housing and security crisis is only going to be exacerbated as we come out of this self-induced coma. I really want to just give a very strong shout out to Maxwell Chardulo and his entire team. Uh, although we, we are here uh, pinning the legislation and we're on camera, the housing advocates have been working very diligently uh, and have been amazingly accessible and helpful throughout this entire process so that uh, these vehicles actually deliver uh, on the promise uh, on the promises that have been laid out. Uh, as Councilmember Banks said better than I will, we are completely and fully com committed to finishing this process. Uh, and, and, and I think I'm, I know I'm very excited that we're finally moving uh, uh, the mapping portion forward uh, and we'll be working on the accompanying enforcement pieces as soon as humanly possible. I believe it was only delayed uh, somewhat uh, due to um, some of the complications from Hurricane Zeta. Uh, but this is a big deal, but this is the beginning of a big deal uh, to help a lot of people. Uh, thank you, Max, and thank you to your entire team. Uh, Madam Clerk, I think we can call the question. 
Council Member Wynn? Yay. Council Member Brissett? Yay. Council Member Williams? Aye. Council Member Moreno? Yay. Council Member Gisselson Palmer? Yay. Council Member Banks? Yay. Council Member Jeruso? Yay. Seven yeas, no nays. The amendment has been adopted. Now we need to move on the ordinance as amended. Move on the ordinance as amended. Second. Council Member Wynn? Yay. Council Member Brissett? Yay. Council Member Williams? Aye. Council Member Moreno? Yay. Council Member Gisselson Palmer? Yay. Council Member Banks? Yay. Council Member Jeruso? Yay. We got seven yeas, no nays. Ordinance calendar number 33,113 has been adopted as amended. We're now on top of page 26. We have ordinance calendar number 33,122 by Council Member Jeruso by request. An ordinance to authorize the mayor of the city of New Orleans to enter into a lease agreement with 373 Walnut Street LLC for a portion of Pertania Street between Walnut Street and Audubon Park to fix the annual rent and terms of said lease agreement to declare that such property to be leased will incorporate space that is neither needed for public purposes nor shall such use interfere with the continuous use of utilities and public infrastructure within the public right of way to set forth the reasons for said lease agreement and otherwise to provide with respect thereto. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I move for approval. May I have a second? Second. Second by Council President Williams. Teresa, do we have any comments? No, Council Member. Thank you. Any comments from my colleagues? Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Council Member Wynn? Yay. Council Member Brissett? Yay. Council Member Williams? Aye. Council Member Moreno? Yay. Council Member Gisselson Palmer? Yay. Council Member Banks? Yay. Council Member Jeruso? Yay. Seven yeas, no nays. Ordinance calendar number 33,122 has been adopted. At the bottom of the page, ordinance calendar number 33,128 has been deferred to November the 19th. On top of page 27, ordinance calendar number 33,141 by Council Member Gisselson Palmer by request. An ordinance to authorize the mayor of the city of New Orleans to enter into an agreement to grant a servitude to an adjacent property owner for encroachments on and over portions of public rights of way located at the municipal address 3350 Dauphine Street to fix the minimum price in terms of said servitude agreement to declare that such use as granted in the servitude agreement will incorporate space that is neither needed for public purposes, nor shall such use interfere with the use of the public right of way to set forth the reasons for said servitude agreement and otherwise to provide with respect thereto. Great. Council members, I move for approval. Do I have a second? Second. second. Thank you, Council Member Jerusa. This is an ordinance for a servitude agreement on 3350 Dauphine Street for steps and an overhang that encroach over the public right of way. This includes a one-time payment of $350. It has been reviewed by the Planning Advisory Committee and a technical review determined that there were no objections uh, to the encroachments. Is there any public comment? No, Council Member. Any comments from the dais? Great, um, can we move for a vote please? Council Member Wynn? Yay. Council Member Brissett? Yay. Council Member Williams? Aye. Council Member Moreno? Yay. Council Member Gisselson Palmer? Aye. Council Member Banks? Aye. Council Member Jeruso? Yay. Seven yeas, no nays. Ordinance calendar number 33,141 has been adopted. Thank At you. the bottom of the page, Ordinance calendar number 33,143 by Council Member Banks by request. An ordinance to authorize the mayor of the city of New Orleans to enter into an agreement to grant a servitude to adjacent property owner for encroachments on and over portions of public right of way located at the municipal address <coughs> 3987 Chapatula Street to fix the minimum price in terms of said servitude agreement to declare that such use is granted 
and the servitude agreement will incorporate space that is neither needed for public purposes nor shall such use interfere with the use of the public right of way to set forth the reasons for said servitude agreement and otherwise to provide with respect thereto. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I move for uh, approval. Can I get a second? Second. Thank you, Joseph. Um, folks, this is uh, addition to new construction. Uh, it's fully permitted. Everything's ready to go. This will be an enhancement to the neighborhood. So with that, I please ask for your support. And Madam Clerk, would you call the roll? Do we have any speakers, uh, Teresa? No, ma'am. Council Member Wynn? Yay. Council Member Brissett? Yay. Council Member Williams? Aye. Council Member Moreno? Yay. Council Member Gisses and Palmer? Yay. Council Member Banks? Yay. Council Member Jeruso. Yay. Seven yeas, no nays. Ordinance calendar number 33,143 has been adopted. We're now on top of page 28. We have ordinance calendar number 33,144 by Council Member Banks by request. An ordinance to authorize the mayor of the city of New Orleans to enter into an agreement to lease to an adjacent property owner for encroachments on and over portions of public of right of way located at municipal address 4645 Ferret Street to fix the minimum price in terms of said lease agreement to declare that such use as granted in the lease agreement will incorporate space that is needed Neither needed for public purposes, nor shall such use interfere with the usage of the public right of way to set forth the reasons for said lease agreement and otherwise to provide with respect thereto. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I move for approval. Can I get a second? Second. Thank you, Council President. Um, folks, this is for the, uh, the development that's taking place at Dallas and Ferret, the old blooming deals that soon to be arouses. Matter of fact, I was there this morning. My barber shop is adjacent to this. So uh, the construction is coming along just fine. And uh, this will be a great enhancement to the neighborhood. So I would ask for your support. And with that, Madam Clerk, if we have no public comment, would you please call the roll? No comment. Council Member Wynn? Yay. Council Member Brissett? Yay. Council Member Williams? Aye. Council Member Moreno? Yay. Council Member Gisselson Palmer? Yay. Council Member Banks? Yay. Council Member Jeruso. Yay. We have seven yeas, no nays. Ordinance calendar number 33,144 has been adopted. At the bottom of the page, ordinance calendar number 33,146 has been deferred to November 19th. On top of page 29. We have ordinance calendar number 33,147 has been deferred to November 19th. Ordinance calendar number 33,149 has been deferred to November 19th. We are now on top of page 30. We have ordinance calendar number 33,150 by council member Brissett. An ordinance to temporarily waive certain fees, permit fees, and requirements at the Lafitte Greenway Field at St. Louis and North Dershawar Streets and field located at St. Louis and North Tonti Streets, New Orleans, Louisiana, in conjunction with events with an open air cinema officially sponsored by the New Orleans Film Society to take place November 5th through November 16, 2020, from 11 a.m. through 11 p.m. to specify the duration and boundaries of said waiver and to provide otherwise with respect thereto. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I would move adoption. Second. Second by Council Member DeRusso. This ordinance is for the P waiver for the New Orleans Film Society uh, for the uh, open cinema uh, out on Lafitte Greenway uh, for November 5th to uh, the uh, 16th. I will move adoption. Second. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Banks. This has been seconded already by Councilmember Jeruso. Uh, is there any public comments? No, sir. Councilmember Wynn? Yay. Councilmember Brissett? Yay. Councilmember Williams? Aye. Councilmember Moreno? Yay. Councilmember Gisselson Palmer? Yay. Councilmember Banks? Yay. Councilmember Jeruso? Yay. We have seven yeas, no nays, and ordinance calendar number 33,150 has been adopted. We're now on top of page 31. Ordinance calendar number 33,152 has been withdrawn. So ordered. 
ordinance calendar number 33,153 by council members Gissus and Palmer and Banks by request. An ordinance preserve parade positions, parade routes, parade times, parade dates, and parade seniority for existing carnival organizations that elect not elect not parade in 2020, 21, I'm sorry, 2021, and to modify the provisions of city code section 3424 applicable to the 2022 carnival season and otherwise to provide with respect there too. Thank you. Um, this was done by myself and council member Banks. Council member Banks, do you wanna, you wanna take the lead or you wanna be the closer? Um, whatever you say. I mean, I'm good either way. All right. Well, I'll go ahead and read my remarks and I'll let you close it out. Make sure I, I hit everything. Sound good? Okay. Um, Y'all, as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to stress on uh, for the foreseeable future, we unfortunately are confronted by the very real possibility of a different type of Mardi Gras in 2021. While February 16th, 2021 is still several months off, the uncertainties caused by the pandemic has caused many crews to see a significant dip in riders signing up to parade. They therefore find themselves in the position of being unable to guarantee whether or not they have the means to organize a parade for this carnival season. As currently written, the Mardi Gras ordinance allows for 30 permits for the main parade routes to be issued per year and gives seniority to those crews that have consistently rolled. Choosing not to parade in 2021 threatens that seniority and might lead to traditional participants losing out in 2022. We do not want to incentivize crews to parade in 2021 if they are financially unable or concerned about public health benefits to their parades. After speaking with representatives of different organizations and the mayor's office, Councilmember Banks and myself have authored an ordinance to allow crews to opt out of 2021 without risking their seniority for 2022. But to be clear, this is not canceling Mardi Gras parades. This is simply a common sense protection that crews may choose to avail themselves of should it become untenable for their organizations to participate. Um, so with that, Councilmember Banks, do you want, you want to? Uh, yes, ma'am, thank you. Um, it, it's no secret, I've got a little bit of stuff to do with Mardi Gras. And um, I've had many, many, many conversations in my capacity outside of a council member talking to members of various Mardi Gras organizations. And there was a real concern that this COVID epidemic, pandemic, devastating circumstance that we find ourselves in was going to cause far more damage, long-term damage. And the issue is Mardi Gras is the greatest free show on earth for the people standing on the neutral ground or on the sidewalk saying, throw me something. But for the people that actually have to put on the parades, it's not free. As a matter of fact, it is very, very expensive. It's a labor of love by New Orleanians who have this inside of our bodies, inside of our very being to, to do these Mardi Gras parades. But the reality of it is, is that we've got a tremendous portion of our population that is hurting and hurting bad. And the fear that folks would lose their spots or their ability to parade is something that is definitely out there. And we wanted to make sure that no one had to live with that. Now, this again, I'm gonna echo what my colleague just said, this by no means cancels Mardi Gras. But what this does is it gives the crews the legal authority to be able to stand down if they have to. Now, the health concerns are real. Regardless of what the president might say, I don't think that the virus is just going to go away. I know that the economic impact of it is definitely still here today, and it's likely to be here in February. And the reality of it is, is that people may not be able to financially afford to do it, and also we may not be able to physically do it with the circumstances of the virus the way they are. All this does is give them the ability to be able to say, okay, we're going to hit the pause button for our own fiscal stability or our own physical safety. We're going to stand down. So with that, uh, colleagues, I would ask that, uh, that, that you all support this. Um, I know that the mayor's task force is meeting 
this afternoon. Don't know what's going to come out of that meeting, but the Mardi Gras Task Force is meeting today. And the decisions related to whether Mardi Gras happens is not going to be driven by this legislation. It's going to be driven by the circumstances of the virus, pure and simple. But we need to be intentional to make sure that no one feels any added pressure, that they've got to do something that they physically are reluctant to do or financially are unable to do. So with that, thank you, uh, Council Member Palmer. And we call for the question. I need a move and a second, please. Oh, I thought she moved and I second, but oh, okay, I'll leaving. move and she can second. Thanks. Say, I'm sorry? I was leaving that honor to you, Councilor. Oh, well, well, thank you so much. And in that case, uh, I move and would you honor me with seconding, please, ma'am? I, I will second it, yes. Thank you. Council Member Wynn. Yay. Council Member Brissett. Council Member Williams. Aye. Yes. I Council Member Brissett. Thank you. Council Member Williams? Aye. Council Member Moreno? Yay. Council Member Gisselson Palmer? Yay. Council Member Banks? Yay. Council Member Jeruso? Yay. Seven yeays, no nays. Ordinance calendar number 33,153 has been adopted. We're now on top of page 32, a legislative grouping. Ordinance calendar number 33,154 by Council Member Banks an ordinance to establish a conditional use to permit a motor vehicle service and repair facility minor in an MU1 medium intensity mixed use district and an HUC, HUC historic urban corridor use restriction overlay district on square 653 lot 14A in the first municipal district bounded by Dehema Court Street, Tulane Avenue, South Lopez Street, South Salcedo Street and Bolden Street. Municipal addresses 3125 Tulane Avenue or 3125 Dehema Court Street and 518 South Lopez Street and otherwise to provide respect there too. Zoning docket 6620. Amendment to ordinance calendar number 33154 by Council Member Banks. An amendment to replace the entirety of Proviso 10 as follows. The site shall be permitted to have a curb cut and driveway from Tulane Avenue and or Dehema Court Street. The developer should continue to work to engage the Tulane Avenue right of way for pedestrians and other multimodal forms of transit. That is the amendment. You're on mute, Council Member Banks. I'm sorry. I uh, move that we adopt the amendment. Can I get a second? Second. Thank you, Council Member Wynn. Madam Clerk, do we have any comments? No, sir. All right, Council Madam Clerk. Council Member Wynn. Yay. Council Member Bank. I'm Bursette. Yay. Council Member. Williams. Aye. Council Member Moreno. Yay. Council Member Gisson Palmer. Yay. Council Member Banks. Yay. Council Member Jeruso. Yay. We have seven yeas, no nays, and the amendment has been adopted. Madam Clerk, I move that we approve the ordinance as amended. Can we get a second? Second. Thank you, Cindy. Um, colleagues, this is uh, this was Superior Honda on two lane. We took this off the consent because we needed to add that proviso. Uh, this too is a real good enhancement to the neighborhood. And uh, we, uh, we are vehemently supporting this and hope that you will too. So with that, Madam Clerk, would you call the question? We have Council Member Wynn. Yay. Council Member Brissett. Yay. Council Member Williams. Aye. Council Member Moreno. Yay. Council Member Gisson Palmer. Yay. Council Member Banks. Yay. Council Member Jeruso. Yay. We have seven yeas, no nays. Ordinance calendar number 33,154 has been adopted as amended. On page 33, all matters. Ordinance calendar number 33,155 has been deferred to 1119. Ordinance calendar number 33,156 has been deferred to 1119. On top of page 34, we have ordinance calendar number 33,157 by Council Member Williams by request. 
and ordinance approving an ad valorem collection and distribution cooperative endeavor agreement by and between the city of New Orleans and the board of liquidation city debt relating to the collection and distribution of the revenues of a special ad valorem tax, co tax collected within the city and providing for other matters in connection therewith and otherwise to provide with respect thereto. Council Member Williams. Repeat that, Madam Clerk, I couldn't hear you. We're on top of page 34, ordinance calendar number 33,157. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I appreciate that. I, I was in another conversation. An ordinance approving the ad valorem collection and distribution, uh, the CEA between the city and the Board of Lick. Uh, this is really very, very perfunctory uh, in terms of uh, the Board of Lick being able to do uh, and move forward and execute on items that are already laid out. We have Jason Akers on the line. Thank you, Jason for doing that, uh, for being on, uh, in case there are any questions. I would move adoption, ask for a second, and then we shift to any Q&A that's there. Second. Second by Council Member Jerusso. Thank you, Joseph. Um, any questions for Jason uh, from the dais? Can he just give a brief synopsis about what this is about? Absolutely, that's what he gets paid to do. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Council Members. Uh, Jason Akers with Foley New Dell. Uh, pleasure to see you all virtually again. Uh, this, let me take a step back. In 2019, as you recall, uh, the voters approved a consolidation of a few different millages that were being levied at the time uh, into what is now called the Parks Millage. Uh, one of those millages that was, uh, that was consolidated and combined into the new millage uh, benefited the Audubon Commission Aquarium and uh, that had bonds outstanding associated with it. So the parks millage actually notes that those outstanding bonds get paid first out of the proceeds. So the parks millage, when it gets levied uh, beginning next year. The original Audubon millage was actually levied pursuant to statute. And that statute contained some, uh, some requirements on how those funds were to be received by the city, paid over to the board of liquidation to pay uh, debt service on outstanding bonds and then released to the intended beneficiaries. But when we combine the parks millage in 2019, uh, those statutory provisions went away. They're no longer applicable. And there are no, uh, uh, there are no uh, associated statutory provisions that would be applicable in their place. So what we uh, thought would be best is to just make a contractual obligation what used to be a statutory obligation. Uh, the requirements are the same on the city, on the finance department, um, that they will receive the proceeds of the tax and pay them over, not the entire tax, but the portion that's uh, for the uh, prior debt, prior bond debt service, and we'll pay it over to board of liquidation, which would then pay the debt service on the bonds. We do take it a step further and provide that any of the additional beneficiaries of the parks millers that choose to issue bonds uh, that are secured by their portion of the tax, each, any series such like that would have to be approved by this council, but, but the same provisions would apply to them as well, uh, so that uh, their portion of the tax would go to the Board of Liquidation first to pay debt service on bonds prior to being used for the other uh, intended purposes. Um, it doesn't uh, impact any of the other uh, recipients as intended, only, um, only the, uh, per, the recipients who choose to avail themselves of this particular um, benefit. This is the purpose of the Board of Liquidation. It's there to ensure that debt service on the bonds that are issued uh, by the city get paid, and this CEA will help us to ensure that that happens. Jason, thank you for articulating that so very well. Uh, we have a motion and a second. I don't believe we have public comment card, or do we? No, sir. Uh, Madam Clerk, call Council the Member Wynn. Yay. Council Member Brissett. Yay. Council Member Williams. Aye. Council Member Moreno. Yay. Council Member Gisson Palmer. Yay. Council Member Banks. Yay. Council Member Jeruso. Yay. We have seven yays, no nays. Ordinance calendar number 33,157 has been adopted. Thank you. Ordinance calendar number 33,160 has been deferred to November 19th. Ordinance calendar number 33,161 has been deferred to November the 19th. On top of page 35, all matters. 
ordinance calendar number 33,162 has been deferred to 1119. 33,164 has been deferred to 1119. Motion and motion line over. M20-326 has been deferred to 1119. We're now on top of page 36. We have motion M20-369 by council members Williams, Moreno, Jeruso, Banks, Gisson Palmer, Brissett, and Wynn. A resolution authorizing the president of the city council of the council to sign a cooperative endeavor agreement with the Orleans Parish Sheriff Office for Security Services for the City Council for the period of January the 1st, 2020 through December 31st, 2020, for a maximum compensation amount not to exceed $46,399.62 three cents per month or $556,795.56 for 12 months. That is Thank you, Madam Clerk. I would move adoption. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Joseph Jerusa. Uh, any public comment? No, sir. Any questions from the dais? Uh, Madam Clerk. Council Member Wynn? Yay. Council Member Brissett? Yay. Council Member Williams? Aye. Council Member Moreno? Yay. Council Member Gisselson Palmer? Yay. Council Member Banks? Yay. Council Member Jeruso? Yay. Seven yeas, no nays. Motion M2369 has been adopted. Resolution R2370 by Council Member Gisselson Palmer by request. A resolution certifying that the parish of Orleans has performed all interim inspections on all parish owned or maintained bridges in accordance with the National Bridge Inspection Standards for the period October 1st, 2029 through November 15th, 2020, including reviewing and updating bridges loaded postings. All right, um, so moved. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Council Member Jerusso. Council Members, this is an uh, annual resolution that we've already passed twice in accordance with LADOT rules. BPW introduces this every year after all parish owned or maintained bridges have been inspected in accordance with the National Bridge Inspection Standards. This allows for continued participation in LADOTD's Office Off System Bridge Program, which can provide federal or state funding for the city. Um, are there any questions regarding this or public comments? No, ma'am. Great. Um, then let's call for a vote, please. Council Member Wynn? Yay. Council Member Brissett? Yay. Council Member Williams? Council Member Moreno? Yay. Council Member Gisselson Palmer? Yay. Council Member Banks? Yay. Council Member Jeruso? Yay. We got six yays, no nays, and motion, I mean, resolution R20-370 has been adopted. At the bottom of the page, resolution R20-372 by Council Member Jeruso adding Council Member Banks. A resolution supporting the Iris Development's Affordable Housing Program application to Federal Home Loan Bank of Dallas for subsidy to develop affordable housing on vacant handled land awarded via competitive request for proposals. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, colleagues, you know that I'm not a fan of resolutions generally and don't co-author, but this one is worthy of that. Iris Development, which is working to restore affordable housing in the Carrollton Leonis neighborhood and also in council member Banks's district as well needs a resolution from us in order to secure additional funding to take this to reality. First, I wanna thank the neighbors who've been a part of this. They've seen a number of design changes as a result of their engagement. IRIS, which has been a great partner and also has been open to those discussions and changes. And a shout out as well to Office of Community Development, which helped us facilitate some of the changes that the neighbors were interested in. So with that, um, does anybody have any comments? Council Member Banks, do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, Council Member, I think you, you, you handled it. Um, this is a good thing. So we wanna get them the help we can get to get more housing in place. Thank you. Uh, with that, I would move for approval. May I have a second? Second. Do we have any comments, Teresa? Yes, sir, we have one. 
It's from Maxwell Ciaduro. The, fir the Fair Housing Action Center applauds the council for supporting these important developments. Now more than ever, we need affordable housing and gentrifying and high opportunity neighborhoods like Leonidas, the Lower Garden District and the Irish Channel. LAFHAC staff has been present for a number of these developer meetings with neighborhood groups and can attest to their extraordinary efforts to address concerns. We look forward to seeing these homes built as soon as possible. And he notes that he is a paid representative of the Louisiana Fair Housing Center. Those are all the comments for this meeting. Thanks much, Ms. Beecher. Madam Clerk? Council Member Wynn? Yay. Council Member Brissett? Yay. Council Member Williams? Aye. Councilmember Moreno? Yay. Councilmember Gisson Palmer? Yay. Councilmember Banks? Yay. Councilmember Jeruso? Yay. We have seven yays, no nays. Resolution R2372 has been adopted. We're now on top of page 37. We have motion M2373 by Council Members Williams, Moreno, Jeruso, Banks, Gisson Palmer, Brissett, and Wynn. A motion adopting the holiday schedule for the city government for year 2021. Move adoption. Second. Council member Wynn. Yay. Council member Brissett. Aye. Council member Williams. Aye. Council member Moreno. Yay. Council member Gisson Palmer. Yay. Council member Banks. Yay. Council member Jeruso. Yay. Seven yeas, no nays. Motion M2373 has been adopted. We have motion M2374 by Council Member Gisselson Palmer. A motion stating that the City Council Street Renaming Commission shall have until November 30th, 2020 to deliver to the City Council the initial report and recommendation, recommendation described in motion M2170. Uh, I uh, so move. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Thank you. I'm not sure who that was. Um, Council members, this is an amendment to the motion establishing the Streets Renaming Commission extending their de deadline for submitting an initial report by one month. I have a letter from the chair of the commission explaining this request that I'd like to read into the record. Dear council members Palmer and Banks, as chair of the City Council Streets Renaming Commission, I write this letter to provide an update on our progress. Commissioners and our volunteer research teams have been hard at work since the commission's inception to create and adopt policies around renaming and then apply those in identifying both streets, parks, and places to be renamed as well as deserving candidates for recognition moving forward. We have also begun the process of outreach to specific stakeholders and soon we'll be conducting a series of virtual meetings for residents around the city to ensure robust public input. Unfortunately, even we have moved forward with all possible speed. I regret to inform you that the commission will not meet the three month deadline for an initial report to be transmitted to the city council as required in motion M2170. We're therefore requesting a one month extension to that deadline. I'm happy to speak on this matter further if you have any questions or concerns. Thank you, Carl Connor, chair, city council streets renaming commission. Um, Y'all, my office and I know other offices as well have been working closely with commissioners so I can confirm that they're proceeding in a timely manner. Um, I just also wanna thank Councilman Jeruso. I know you've done a lot of heavy lifting on this, working with your representative as well and all your neighborhood groups. I believe this one month extension will ensure the recommendations we receive reflect the very best of what this group can do. Um, are there any questions regarding this? I don't have any questions. I just wanna say thank you, Councilmember Palmer and Banks and that I know that certain members of the commission have already met with at least one of my neighborhood groups. They're meeting tonight with another one and then Tuesday with, with the third. So the work is in progress. Awesome, that's great to know. Excellent, so um, with that, could we have a vote please? Council member Wynn. Yay. Council member Brissett. Yay. Council member Williams. Aye. Council member Moreno. Yay. Council Member Gisselson Palmer. Yay. Council Member Banks. Yay. Council Member Jeruso. Yay. Seven yeas, no nays. Motion M2374 has been adopted. Resolution R2380 by Council Member Moreno. 
a resolution and order extending the application deadline for the City Council CARES program to December 31st, 2020. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Clark. Well, you said it just uh, perfectly. What we're doing is we're extending the deadline uh, to apply for the City Council CARES program. It's the uh, program through Entergy New Orleans that allows for uh, a $400 credit on people's accounts who have been struggling through this COVID pandemic. We've helped over 7,000 people so far, but obviously help is still needed. So we're going to extend the, the deadline until December 31st, 2020. And I do want to mention to the council and to uh, to the members of the public as well, that um, you know we're gonna have to take a look at this program and see how we can expand it because we do have a considerable amount of money left. So I want all of us to put our heads together. I'm gonna be having an additional um, utilities committee meeting on this as well to see how we can expand the program and help as many customers uh, as we can. So, so just know that that's also coming down the pipeline as well. But for now, we're just going to extend um, the deadline to December 31st, 2020. So that's what this resolution does. Kristen, sorry, Council Member Palmer. Yeah, no, <laughs> I prefer Kristen. Um, thanks so much, Council Moreno. I just wanna say that um, this has been a real big help. We, we sometimes have um, office hours in different neighborhoods and we've had some some elderly folks that didn't even know about mm -hmm. the program. And often, you know, they're not, they're not connected to social media and whatnot. And so we were able to help them just by interfacing and they were really ecstatic about the program. So I just wanna thank you for that. And I think we do need to reach further into some of these communities to make sure people are aware of it. And, and that's really, yeah, a big piece of this extension is that we still know that there's so many customers who need help, but they just still don't know about the program. So um, we're just gonna continue to, to, to dole out these dollars as, as much as we can to help as many customers. Any other questions? All right, seeing none. And Teresa, I think you said that was all the public comment for the meeting. So I don't know if yes, we have any. Okay, great. Thanks, Teresa. All right, well, I will move adoption. Can I get a second? second? A second. second. The president, Madam Clerk, if you could call the roll, please. Council Member Wynn. Yay. Council Member Brissett. Aye. Council Member Williams. Aye. Council Member Moreno. Yay. Council Member Gisselson Palmer. Yay. Council Member Banks. Yay. Council Member Jeruso. Yay. We have seven yeas, no nays. Resolution 2380 has been adopted. Council members, we need to go back to page 23. Is someone going to speak on this or do we just go ahead with the vote? I believe we do have Jonathan Rhodes on the line now. Mr. Rhodes? Hi. Can you, can you all hear me? Yes. We can, we can hear you fine. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we uh, we're talking about this item before, and there were a, a number of questions. I will uh, turn it over to Council Vice President first. I believe her question was on the floor, and we'll go from there. Thank you, Mr. President. Hey, Jonathan, good afternoon. Thank you for, for being with us. Uh, my question was about uh, involvement of the community when it comes to the design. And Council Member Palmer um, was able to partly answer my question because she has been involved with, um, with overall uh, neighbors and residents um, with initial conversations about what the design would look like. But then she also said that there's not satisfaction yet in that design. So my question is, what assurances do we have that this, um, that this involvement of neighbors and residents is going to continue and that nothing will be put up until there is some type of consensus that, that comes together on what that design should look like. I just want to make sure that we're not going to move forward on putting stuff up that neighbors are like, this is absolutely horrible. This is going to ruin, you know, the aesthetic of the French Quarter or my neighborhood. So that, that was my question to you, Jonathan. Thank you. And I apologize for the technical uh, issues before and apologize for making you all wait. Um, to answer your question, I would like to give you know the, the fullest assurance that we are going to do everything we can to engage community. And Jonathan, can you speak up just a little bit? I'm having a little trouble hearing you. I'm sorry. Um, is that any better? Much. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, sorry, you have to just look closely at my face. Um, so the uh, I just want to give you my full assurance is that we are doing everything we can to engage community in the design process and the installation process. Um, and we will continue to do that. This is very important um, uh, you know, to the entire city to make sure that as we roll out new technologies, especially this technology, this small cell 5G technology that, 
that requires from these carriers a, a lot of new infrastructure that we're very careful about the design and the location and the use of our rights of way. Um, I just mentioned quickly that these small cells are not entirely new. We have, you know, almost, well, hundreds of them actually around the city and they've been going up since probably 2014. So it was actually uh, because the community started to see that the design was not really appropriate for some of the neighborhoods that we've really taken a step back to rethink how we're gonna deploy some of these things. And so for the last 18 months, really, we've been um, looking at redesigning in the French Quarter in particular, because that's one of the most sensitive areas uh, aesthetically and because of the, the limited amount of right of way, um, uh, as well as because of the high number of, of poles that the companies want to put. So that's where we've really focused the design, but that doesn't mean that we're not going to have the same level of focus for other parts of the city um, after we get through the sort of French Quarter design. And I understand that the design is not fully complete and is not, um, um, I guess, been accepted by the community yet. So we're, we're with you all um, and we want to get to that, to that good place where people are, are comfortable with what may go up. Gotcha. I just, like I said, I just wanted to make sure that to get an assurance from you that that was going to happen, that you are going to keep working toward getting to that acceptance of the design, that something isn't just going to go up and, you know, um, without making sure that there is some satisfaction uh, on the part of residents and, and business owners as well uh, in the French Quarter. Absolutely. We've come this far. We're not going to stop now until we get something that's really great for the city. Um, again, it's been about 18 months. You know, it's hard to believe, but we're going to keep at it. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I don't want to get ahead of us, but I think we can do something really great and actually something that is um, nationally leading in the way we design and, and place and these poles, but protect our city as well. So that's what we're going for. And I know you all are you know, with us on that as well. Appreciate it, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Jonathan, if I could ask you to walk us through, um, I know I've gotten some calls and some other colleagues uh, have gotten some calls. Can you walk us through the process you're using uh, for community engagement? Um, I would just say oftentimes uh, we look at a, an end result, hope for a beautiful uh, end product, but the process of getting it, getting to that point is often more, more important as, or, or rather equally as important uh, to getting there. So can you just walk us through what that community engagement has looked like so far and, 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 and speak to it from a perspective so people in this area can know how to further engage as we move forward? So I agree, um, education and understanding and engagement is critical. This is a new technology. Um, it's new infrastructure. So uh, residents, businesses in New Orleans need to understand what they're looking at. Um, I can't tell you an exact number. We have probably had at least a dozen meetings with French Quarter groups over the last year. Um, you know, your VC Poras and, and business, uh, you know, associations, et cetera, um, to discuss the issue. Uh, and to understand the issues. Um, we have also been having um, public meetings through the VCC where presentations are being made about the, the issue, the, 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 the proposed polls and what some other cities are doing. Uh, and we've also just started to have meetings through the HDLC public meetings. Uh, we had one yesterday um, through the HDLC in New Orleans and we have one scheduled for next month for the CBD. Um, so we're continuing to use that process. Um, uh, we've also gone to neighborhood association meetings um, to make these presentations. So as, as these polls or as neighborhoods see these um, polls going up or, or have questions about whether they will go up, um, you know, we're happy to make uh, through our Office of Neighborhood Engagement, um, you know, uh, presentations at, at community meetings, neighborhood association meetings to educate the public again. Is that and true? It, it does. And I'm just wondering, has the uh, the COVID-19 socially uh, distancing uh, measures, has that made it more difficult to engage with people? And are there, are, are there any plans to engage differently? Um, actually, you, that's a good point. I would say no, although it's hard to tell who's disconnected and not able to join us for our virtual presentations. Um, so um, we've had great you know, representation on, on Zoom presentations for these uh, uh, communities. We've also done uh, two in-person prototype viewings in the French Quarter. 
So these were actually not only in-person meetings just last month, but um, also showing what a sample uh, poll might look like. Um, so we'll continue to do those as well. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Councilmember Palmer. Did you have anything to? Um... No, just uh, I just want to kind of restate a little bit of what I stated last time about the co-location of the polls. Jonathan, I, I, I talked with you about that out at the site when you um, when the polls were going in and, and that there seems to be some confusion in terms of whether or not some of these companies want to co-locate. And and I'm assuming that these polls are being are being designed so you can have co-location. My concern is that the companies don't want to co-locate and that um, we, I just want us to make sure we have the tools to say you have to co-locate because I also don't want, um, what I stated earlier, a ton of polls all over the place, you know? Yeah, so this is really the heart of, part of the problem. There are proposals for 200 new polls in the French Quarter. That is a lot of new polls. Um, there are currently 768 lampposts in the French Quarter. So there's proposals to add almost, you know, 20% uh, more infrastructure in an already crowded location. I don't have to tell you that, uh, council members. So um, we're really trying to work with these companies to find a solution whereby there will be no net gain of polls in the French Quarter, because I I don't think the residents uh, feel that there is any more room for any more infrastructure um, in that area. The, uh, and it's not, because it's not just the polls, right? You're also looking at gallery polls, right? On top of poll signage, which is insane down there. You need a college degree to figure out where to park half the time. So, you know, I mean, I hope there's some kind of coordination with DPW um, and the residents, but 200 more polls is just, is, not, is untenable. I agree, we all agree. And one of the solutions, so as a city, we can regulate the design of the polls and the location of the polls to some degree. Under federal law, we have to all remember, um, um, and I know Aaron Spears has probably caught you up on all this, we are, are restricted to some degree in what we can do. Um, so we're trying to walk that line. We, need, we can focus on the design and the location and we are doing that. Um, so we want to make sure the polls look right for the French Quarter in particular, but also let's put them in places, um, you know, if we can replace existing infrastructure with new polls, we can see a, a situation where we have no net gain of polls. In fact, we would like to reduce the number of polls, right? Let's put wayfinding and other signage on these polls and, and reduce the number of polls overall. Um, so that is something that we are committed to doing. Um, and to your earlier point, uh, Councilmember Palmer, whether the companies want to co-locate or not, um, there are common use provisions in their franchise agreements that um, require them to make their best efforts to locate on other existing polls or to allow others to locate on their polls. So we wanna hold them to those agreements. Um, and and I, I think that we can find mutually beneficial solutions with these companies um, that wanna get out there and, and deploy their equipment. Thank you. Any other questions from the dais? Seeing none, um, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, thank you, Ms. Spears. Um, I think we had a motion and a second out of abundance of caution. I will move again. Can I get a second? Second. Seconded by Council Member Jerusso. Madam Clerk. Council Member Wynn. Yay. Council Member Brissett. Yay. Council Member Williams. Aye. Council Member Moreno. Yay. Council Member Gisson Palmer. Yay. Council Member Banks. Yay. Council Member Jeruso. Yay. We have seven yays, no nays. Ordinance calendar number 33,088 has been adopted. Council Members, we now need to suspend the rules to go to ordinances on first reading. I would move to suspend the rules. Second. Second by Council Vice President. Councilmember Wynn. Yay. Yay. Council, Council Member Brissett. Yay. Council Member Williams. Aye. Council Member Moreno. Yay. Council Member Gisson Palmer. Yay. Council Member Banks. Yay. Council Member Jeruso. Yay. We have seven yays, no nays. The rules are now suspended. Madam Clerk, before you start reading, I just wanted to just 
take a point of personal privilege to uh, say a proper goodbye uh, to Mr. McKnight. Um, Mike has really stepped in uh, at probably one of the most difficult times that I think any city council has ever seen, uh, whether it is dealing with, I think he jumped right into the budget, then a cyber attack, and then all city systems were down. And then now the financial impacts of COVID-19. I have a resolution. He's on, he's on the screen with us. I have a, a proclamation signed uh, by, all, uh, by all council members. And I just want to read it to you so you can put it on your wall in your new office. Whereas a New Orleans City Council appointed Dr. Michael McKnight as its new assistant fiscal officer on October 17th. 2019, and our input, we did not tell you what you were getting into back in October, recognizing his strong government fiscal experience, and whereas Dr. McKnight has served the city council over the past year, as it navigated a number of challenges, including the passage of the 2020 budget, a cyber attack that forced all city computer systems offline, the early logistical financial impacts of, co of the COVID-19 pandemic, and the preparation for solidifying the 2021 budget in light of everything going on with COVID-19. Whereas the council and its staff have enjoyed spending time with you, knowing you and relying on you. Uh, whereas Dr. McKnight has accepted a position as a deputy assistant secretary of culture, recreation and tourism by the state of Louisiana at the request of city council member at large, Jason Rogers Williams be it proclaimed the New Orleans City Council hereby acknowledges Dr. Michael McKnight's contribution to the City Council's operation over the past 12 months. We thank you for your service to this community and all the best in your future endeavors. Uh, the McKnight family has been working for this city in so many different ways. We thank God for your 12 months with us to get us through probably the toughest, I pray, the toughest uh, 12 months any City Council will get. I'm going to turn it over to you, Mike. Thank you, Council President. I really appreciate that. The time here, I learned a lot. I met a lot of good people. I want to miss everybody, but thank you. Appreciate it. We love you, brother, and uh, Godspeed in your new post. I believe uh, Council Council Member Banks wants to weigh in. Mike, I just had to, uh, to, to tell you thank you for your service. Um, we have a relationship outside of City Hall, and I consider you a friend. And I'm very, very grateful for all the contributions that you've done when, since you've been here and have no doubt that you will be very successful in your next step on your journey. I was in the barbershop this morning and I actually commented on the photograph of your son that's hanging over there, over Stan Stahl. I talked about that this morning and ironically, I get to talk to you today. So with that, my friend, I wish you well and please make no mistake, your son is going to be an Omega. Make no mistake about that. <laughs> Thank you, Council Member Banks. Mike, I'm gonna walk this proclamation over to you uh, right now, brother. Okay, thanks. You got it, Miss Temple. Okay. Hello, Council Members. Ordinance Hello. is over. Maybe. Ordinance calendar number 33,165 by Council Member William, an ordinance to amend and reordain Article 12, Section 12.2.A, Table 12 1 of the ordinance number 4264 MCS, amended by ordinance number 26,413 MCS as amended. The comprehensive zoning ordinance of the City of New Orleans to classify tattoo parlor as a permitted use in a historic urban neighborhood business district and otherwise to provide respect there to zoning document number 6720. Ordinance count number 33,166 by Council Member Gilson Palmer and ordinance to establish a conditional use to permit a community facility, a neighborhood commercial establishment in a historic Marinitri by water residential district and residential diversity overlay district and an enhancement of corridor design overlay district on square 629 light three or 10 in lot four or lot 14, or an undesignated lot in the third municipal district bounded by Esplanade Avenue, North Cleveland Avenue, Calabac Street, and North Robinson Street. Municipal addresses 1511 through 1519 Esplanade Avenue, and otherwise to provide respect there to zoning docket number 6820. Ordinance calendar number 33,167 by Council Member Banks. In order to establish a conditional use to permit a motor vehicle dealership large in a CBD4 exposition district and a CBD7 bioscience district 
on square 430, lots 9, 10, 11, 13, 8, 14, 8, Port M, and 17 through 28 in the First Municipal District, founded by Porter Street, South Cleveland Avenue, Clara Street, and Padilla Street. Municipal address is 1709 through 1741 Porter Street, 563 through 524 South Cleveland Avenue, and 515 Clara Street, and otherwise to provide respect there too. Zoning docket number 720. Ordinance calendar number 33,168 by Council Member Wynn, an ordinance to amend and reordain Article 7 of Ordinance number 4264 MCS amended by Ordinance number 26,413 MCS as amended. The comprehensive zoning orders of the City of New Orleans to classify outdoor amusement facility as a permitted use in a general plan development district and the Eastern New Orleans Renaissance Corridor Use Restriction Overlay District impacting parcels in the general plan development district and the Eastern New Orleans Renaissance Corridor Use Restriction Overlay District and otherwise to provide respect there too. Zoning docket number 7320. Ordinance count number 33,169 by Council Member Jeruso in order to establish a conditional use to permit a warehouse in the historic urban neighborhood mixed use district and an enhancement corridor design overlay district on square one, an undesignated lot in port 19 to 22 and port one, two, three and four formerly acquired for the Leak Avenue right of way in the sixth municipal district founded by Chopper's Tula Street, Leak Avenue, Arabella Street and Joseph Street. Municipal address is 5620 Chapel Tula Street and 225 Arabella Street, and otherwise to provide respect there too. Zoning docket number 7420. Ordinance calendar number 33,170 by Council Member Brissett, in order to affect a zoning change from historic urban two family residential district to a historic urban neighborhood business district on, on square H, lot 53, in the third municipal district, bound by Clamata Street, Elder Street, Montclair Street, and Municipal address 3666 Clamata Street and otherwise to provide respect there too. Zoning docket number 7520. That completes all my ordinances on first reading. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We have uh, one final uh, item we were trying to get introduced. I want to, we have to do it under suspension and I want to wait and um, if you can give me one minute, I need to speak to Council Member Jeruso. Okay.
Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I wasn't able to uh, catch him. We can just move forward. Um, okay. I'm going to move to suspend the rules to add one item. Wait, wait, wait. Let okay. me read it into the record. We have resolution R20381 by Council Member Williams requesting all youthful offenders currently held in the adult Orleans Justice Center, OJC, be transferred back to the Juvenile Justice Intervention Center, JJIC, immediately, and the Clerk of Council shall transmit a copy of this resolution upon passage to Orleans Parish Criminal District Court, Orleans Parish Juvenile Court, Orleans Parish District Attorney's Office, and Mayor Latoya Cantrell. We need to suspend the rules to receive this Resolution? Yes, Madam Clerk, I move to suspend the rules. Second. Thank you, Council Member Wynn. Council Clark. Member Wynn? Yay. Council Member Brissett? Yay. Council Member Williams? I just signed some documents. Council Member Moreno? Yay. Council Member Gisselson Palmer? Yay. Council Member Banks? Yay. Council Member Jerusalem? Councilmember Jerusalem is gone? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so we have six yeas, no nays, and the rules are suspended. Now we need to further suspend the rules to add this to the agenda. I move to further suspend the rules to add this to the agenda. Second. Councilmember Wynn? Yay. Councilmember Brissett? Yay. Councilmember Williams? Aye. Council Member Moreno. Yay. Council Member Gisselson Palmer. Yay. Council Member Brissett. I mean Banks. Yay. And Council Member Jerusalem's absence. We have six yeas, no nays, and the rules. This has been added to the agenda, and now we'll take a five-minute recess to receive public comment. Thank you, ma'am.
Madam Clerk, it's my understanding that the comment portal went up a couple minutes late. So let's just extend it instead of five to about uh, 10 minutes, just to be on the safe side. Oh no, that's more than two. Did you get it to send? Thank you, Paul. Got a couple ideas. No surprises. I mean, I, I think I knew everything. Time is that three?
I will do it as soon as we do this thing here. Don't let him sneak off. <laughs> 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 
Good, good. All right, Councilman, we've had the item open for over five minutes. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, that last um, that last measure, uh, resolution number R2381, really just speaks to the council's commitment uh, that we've made over numerous occasions just to treat kids as kids. Um, each year we observe uh, Youth Action Month where advocates each point along the spectrum of how we're treating our young people uh, and that we must not treat people who don't have a, the brain development of adults uh, as adults. And they're just devastating effects uh, of leaving children in adult jail. Um, so with that being said, Madam Clark, thank you. Um, turn it back over to you. We need to, to move and, and um, second, please. I would so move. Second. Thank you, Council Member Wynn. Council Member Wynn. Yay. Council Member Brissett. Yay. Council Member Williams. Aye. Council Member Moreno. Yay. Council Member Gisses and Palmer. Yay. Council Member Banks. Council Member Jeruso. We have five yeas, no nays, and motion, I mean, resolution R2381 has been adopted. We now need to suspend the, I mean, we now need to adjourn. adjourn. <laughs> Move to adjourn. Second. Second, Second by Council Member Wynn. Council Member Wynn. Yay. Council Member Brissett. Yay. Council Member Williams. Aye. Council Member Moreno. Yay. Council Member Gisses and Palmer. Yay. Council Member Banks. Council Member Jeruso. Five yeas, no nays, and the meeting has been adjourned. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Thank you. Y'all have a good weekend. You too. I put 40. <laughs>